Hey guys, I just finished Hell's Paradise and I was really conflicted. I was like, should I do a full review or should I just talk about the perfect character introduction for our main character? Or should I just talk about the characterization of the main character in general? And I think that's what I'm going to do, the third one I mean, because like while the show, I did enjoy it, it is a bit early for me to really have a full understanding of the entire story, I think. I'm not sure if I can do this writing justice because it was damn near perfect, or at least in the characterization of this MC. Holy cow. But I'm gonna do my best to describe to you why I think this works so well. The main character of Hell's Paradise is a shinobi on death row nicknamed Gabimara the Hollow. Because he has no feelings or no qualms about killing, he's just empty inside. Yeah, right, you know this isn't gonna be true. I guess if that was true, I probably wouldn't be talking about him at all, would I? But once again, I'm getting ahead of myself. He is nicknamed that because he is known for supposedly being emotionless and empty and hollow. Just a really cold-blooded killer, I guess. But anyways, I said he is on death row, but every time they try to execute him, it just doesn't work due to the crazy amount of special training or something that he has received. He is basically indestructible. Now, I never said this was going to be realistic, but after several failed attempts to execute this guy, the executioners bring in someone else. Someone who is far more skilled and who can hopefully finish the job for them. This executioner is a woman named Sagiri. Surprisingly, before she tries to kill him though, she actually interviews him and tries to figure out what's going on, why he keeps resisting death when he claims he doesn't actually want to live. While she generally finds him uncooperative, she does eventually discover that he has a wife who he describes as naive and stupid. Why is she naive and stupid? Because she loves him and sees him as a good person deep down. She's onto something here. Once Sagi has gathered all her information, she reveals that she has actually been sent to kill him. For the first time, we see Gabi Maru show fear in this show. Fear because he realizes this woman can do it. She can kill him. This all seems very strange and inconsistent because even though he wouldn't die from the other executions, he also didn't seem to care whether he lived or died at all. Unless, of course, he was lying. Lying to Sagiri, lying to the executioners, lying to the audience, and most of all, lying to himself. This is absolutely the case as Sagiri confronts him while trying to kill him as he's fighting back. She tells him things he has never admitted to himself. You love your wife, you don't want to die. Gabimaru continues to deny this while fighting her, but we can see everything going on in his mind at this moment, and we know that he is lying. He remembers how kind and gentle his wife was with him, how unconditional her love was for him. He remembers being so taken with her that he even faces the chief, who happens to be his wife's father, in order to request to leave his work in order to be with her. This, of course, did not go as he planned. He was betrayed and is now facing execution because of this. All of this winds itself together to be a beautiful character introduction. One, we have a shinobi who is supposedly hollow and cold and heartless. Two, we discover that he is not cold and heartless and, despite calling her stupid, does indeed deeply love his wife. So it's because of her that he does not want to die, but it's because he does not see a life where he can live with her that he also doesn't know how to live. This is just so, so good. Not only is this beautifully complex and human, it also establishes immediately why we should give a crap about this guy and what he's going through, despite the bad things he supposedly has done. We don't just hear it, we aren't left guessing whether or not he loves his wife, we see exactly how she makes him feel and exactly how he feels and it shows in everything he does, in the way he's fighting her. He's just desperate and confused and grieved. Once Gabimaru is finally honest with himself, Sagini presents to him a way out of this nightmare. If he completes a super dangerous mission to retrieve the elixir of life, he can receive a pardon. Not only that, but he can see his wife again and live with her peacefully. Now, if you thought Gabimaru was hard to kill when he wasn't sure whether he wanted to live or die, well, now it's pretty near impossible, because now that he has a way out, he is absolutely sure that he wants to live, and he will do anything. The great characterization doesn't just stop at the intro, though. Once Gabimaru is brought with many other death row criminals to the shogunate, and they all are told that they have to thin the herd to decide which few of them are willing and ready to go, Gabimaru once again displays behavior that doesn't quite line up with his nickname. While the others immediately resort to killing each other, Gabimaru says that he doesn't want to if he doesn't have to, and even pleads with the shogunate for another option. 
Unfortunately, the shogunate doesn't seem to be a great guy and finds the killing entertaining. And so Gabimaru is forced to kill many of the prisoners with little more than his bare hands. But he does so with such ease that the audience is forced to see why this guy is as feared as he is. Of course, we know better than to judge him by his actions because we know what his motivation is. He doesn't want to kill people because his wife doesn't want him to kill people, but he wants to see his wife again, so he has to kill people. That's all pretty deep stuff, but it gets deeper. Gabimaru's resolve is further tested once they arrive at the island that supposedly has the elixir. While he was initially planning to follow the rules, he soon realizes that no one else is doing this. Not even the executioners slash monitors. Both the criminals and the executioners are willing to do whatever it takes to get the elixir first and get out of there alive. Gabimaru realizes that he needs to be prepared to kill Sagiti, his monitor, even though she is the reason he has this chance in the first place. Gabimaru has already proven to us that he can kill if he is motivated by the love for his wife. But this has also literally been his job up until now. It's all he knows. It's all he's been taught. We even see an image of the chief holding his hand over Gabimaru's as he is about to slay Sagiri. The chief tells him in his mind that if he is not strong, then he can't protect anything. Not even the ones he cares about. All emotions make us weak. But even though this always worked for him before, Gabimaru finds himself shaking, hesitating. For some reason, with Sagiri, this feels different. He finds it excruciating and nearly impossible to force himself to kill her. Exactly where the chief's hand was a moment ago, he feels his wife's hand on his hand, holding him back. This is of course just beautiful illustrations happening in his mind, but he's still petrified. For some reason, he can't kill this woman, but if he doesn't, how will he ever be able to see his wife again? Gabimaru breaks down at his apparent weakness and he starts to give in to despair. This is a shit ton of characterization, and all of this happens within the course of only three episodes. After we've established that Gabimaru is not heartless, we also establish that he is still willing to do something as brutal as killing over and over and over again if it means he will see his wife again. But then we also see that there is a point where he is no longer able to go any further. His love for his wife is both a strength and a weakness. Since he loves her so dearly, he will do anything to see her again. But since he also loves her so dearly, there are some things that he just can't do. Even if that means he might not see her again. Girl, this is the stuff. This is the stuff. Like, How often do we have an action show with a character like this who is designed to be terrifying and scary and yet we can see into his heart and mind so deeply that all we as the audience can see is not a killer, not a monster, not a superhuman, but a man. Sometimes we have characters like this who are pretty good, but they're not usually this good. This is so rich. This is so raw. There is just so much for us to hold on to here. We're not hoping that he can become a better person. We know it because we see it. This beautiful contradiction of a man who is both a loving husband and a ruthless killer is nothing short of a masterclass in character writing. You don't see writing like this every day, and for that reason alone, you can bet I'm gonna keep my eye out for season two.